It's nice when they over deliver. <laughs> Although I am understand. Okay. Have you ever it's driven down. in Oak Park? Yep. I was in Oak Park picking up some more toys and I came down a side street and the sign said speed table. Not speed bump, speed table. Yeah, I, you sent me a picture of that. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure why it was a, a considered a, a speed table. It, it, it's big. Well, it's the size, of, it's the length of a car. So basically, <laughs> the whole car is up on it. But uh, well, if you're going too fast, it launches you into near Earth orbit. <laughs> and uh, it also is murder on emergency vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have them in some communities in Massachusetts. Okay. Especially around schools. They yeah. do have more of an effect than speed bumps. <laughs> I, even even in, as much as in Vegas, which has the world's largest speed bumps. <laughs> well, you said they had speed tables, so that must be yeah. something there. But, it, but you go through some of the parking lots in Vegas, and those speed bumps are, <laughs> are just, even going slow, you tend to bottom on them. Yeah, they are they are amazing. Okay, so we may as well get the meeting started. Um, first off, we'll have op open forum. If anybody's got any particular burning questions that they would like to ask of the group and see if anyone else has the answer, this is a good time to go ahead and do it. Uh huh. Just just to finish off, there's the deconstructed cheese uh, carrot cake. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I think I would go on for the uh, cheesecake with the uh, swan. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just not a white chocolate fan, so that's why I didn't, didn't, didn't do that one. I still don't see where they deconstructed the, the carrot cake to the point where the carrot is separate. Mm. Well, you see that little <laughs> sliver of carrot on top. Um, and, oh, that's uh, carrot. Yeah. That's carrot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, the, and the nuts. And there's actually a little gold foil on the chocolate on the right. Um, but but again, it, it didn't taste anything really to me like carrot cake. It wasn't bad. It didn't taste anything like carrot cake. Okay. Let me, All right. Is there any ideas on how to tight? I mean, I'm sure there isn't, but I'll, I'll ask just in case somebody has a thought. Um, I have a loose USB port. In other words, the device keeps attaching and detaching and attaching and detaching in that port. Is there is there any idea on tightening up the USB port? It's on a note. It's on a notebook, so it isn't like there's anything I can really do to remove it you have more than one port yes i do and it doesn't occur on any other port correct usually what i've seen in those cases it's either going to be a dirty contact best thing you could do would probably and use any contact cleaner and maybe a q-tip very carefully try not to damage the contacts if it is actually a cold solder joint you'd have to basically try and touch up the reflow on the bottom of the board where the uh, USB connector went in. Sometimes okay. the USB connectors are not directly connected on the motherboard, but are connected through a small pigtail cable, and then they go onto the motherboard that way. But it depends on the laptop, and you'd be taking it down to its component atoms to get there. Yeah, and that's not happening usually what i've done if i have a bad usb port on a unit i just put a usb hub and plug things in through the hub and that's usually suffices for most of the connections that need to be done i i've also found that sometimes especially in flash drives usb i uh, plugs are not precisely the same size as one another some are a little bigger and fatter some are a little a tiny bit smaller and sometimes one will be snug and another won't. And then through use, you have worn the contacts a lot, plugging in all those flash drives. I have one on one side of my laptop, which is less reliable than the other ones. 
So I tend to use the ones that work. (laughs) And that is why I use a hub when the device is new and continue to use the hub or a cable. Yeah. So that that doesn't get plugged and unplugged as much. Right. But I, on my phone, one of those micro uh, USB, but it's a USB C style. I I had one actually get some mud into it. Hmm. Oh. And so I had to, I had to use a flat <laughs> toothpick to get it out. Uh huh. Yeah, <laughs> something with plastic on it that you can use very carefully because, like I said, the gold foil on that contact doesn't take much to rub it off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I actually used a wooden toothpick, but a flat one. Okay, that works. It got the mud, and uh, I got the connection back, and I'm fast charging as I was before. Cool. I'd I like to hear the story how you got the mud in there. Bob. <laughs> oh, I, I am what is known as a volunteer trail steward, and I do a lot of outdoors work by pulling up plants that aren't supposed to be there, putting in plants that we want that are native. And uh, cleaning up trails and various things like that. So uh, the phone gets in wherever I get in. <laughs> On this occasion, it was a pretty muddy patch. You are a buckthorn remover. I, among other things, roses and various other stuff that shouldn't be there. Uh, bittersweet is a big one here. A, uh, Asiatic bittersweet. Do you have fake Solomon seal too? Uh, We do, but we don't consider that terribly invasive because it doesn't spread too badly here. Uh, The bittersweet is a whole lot worse. It pulls down trees. Uh, The thing that we have here is just horrible as garlic mustard. We have it too. (laughs) And uh, the recent uh, advice on that stuff is don't just do one pull per year. (laughs) (laughs) They want you to use something more toxic. You know, I think... you could use Paraquat, but I think gasoline works pretty good. I We try to use non-herbicide methods, but uh, I guess you'd say that uh, gasoline is not an herbicide. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's, uh, it's an ozone-depleting chemical, but it helps if you let throw a match on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, getting back to computers. <laughs> yeah, back to computers. Okay, yeah. sorry. Diverted there. I was uh, and I inherited part of my mom's green thumb. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, this had to do with the USB port. So it was peripherally yeah, yeah. connected. <laughs> peripherally, <laughs> literally. <laughs> other, other questions? Everyone's silent out there. Kathy, didn't you have a question? Or did that an- answer your question? I, I, I do. And I, I'm reading your response. But what... Just so everybody else knows, I sent Ed an email earlier saying that in a recent meeting, um, somebody had said that Microsoft is going to uh, stop supporting Win 10 2004 in December, I believe it was. And back last October, um, Ed had given a presentation on how to, what is it, keep, keep uh, 2004 as your, you know, you didn't want to bring your system up to whatever the current, uh, what the current uh, version was, and how you could keep it at 2004 uh, using GP Edit. And so after the presentation, I did uh, do those changes. So my system currently is at 2004, but now that it is um, not going to be supported anymore, I'd like to bring it up to whatever the current release is. So I went back and I looked at the presentation and I wanted to make sure I understand how, how I go about undoing that now. And so and I saw your response that says you might find the response. Yeah, in, in, in the, uh, I had done that on one of this, I think it was this machine, and it was locked at 2004, and I never saw any updates for anything else. But I went in, and I just happened to find somewhere in the update and uh, Windows update section, I found something about restricting the version, and I just checked, un- uh, took that thing off, and it went away. 
if, if you don't find that, do you have the instructions what you originally did? I, I do have the instructions. I followed them to a T, what you said to do. Okay. And the, la and the last step took you down to... Did you where? add a key? Did you add a key for keeping it from doing something or did you change the value? I don't know what you mean by a key. In GP edit, you either added a new key and then set it to do not update or something like that, or you changed an existing key to said do not update. Well, on the uh, on the last page, you said to say um, it, it 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 was originally clicked on not configured, and target version for feature updates was blank. Yeah. And so you told us to click on enabled, which I did. <laughs> yeah. And then under the the field called target version for feature updates, I entered two thousand and four. So what you can do is you can go back into GP edit, locate the exact same thing that said 2004, and you can either clear the value or set it, or I'm going to say it said, it said it was not configured for the 2004 or what did it just say? Uh, well, before I entered 2004, the screen came up saying not configured. Well, you can make it not configured then. So make just make it not configured and just take out the 2004. Yeah, yeah, okay. that will do it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would do the 2004 first and then go back to the other one because you're undoing it in the same order which you added it. Got it. Okay, okay. And then it should be very happy to go ahead and uh, allow you or try and force you into 21H1 or is it 21H2? I forgot. Uh, 21H2. Yeah. Yeah, because the 21H1 is no longer in my Windows update. You'll have to find a different way to do the manual update by finding that version and making a bootable USB. Yeah, I uh, if you... Uh... If you set it to 21H1, that's what it will download when it goes to do a feature update. It okay. won't go for 21H2 because either that just came out or it isn't out yet. I think mm -hmm. it just came out. I think and it came out because it's offered on this machine already. I think it's either 21H1 or 21H2 for Windows 10. You now get to specify whether you want Windows 10 21H2 or whether you want Windows 11 21H2. Yeah. That is in that same place in group policy. It has just one additional uh, parameter. Uh -huh. One additional number. Yeah, I, I noticed on the Microsoft uh, um, volume licensing site, they happen to have several of the 21 uh, updates and you can either choose, uh, I think it was last May or, or November updates. So if you want to chance an older one instead of the newest one, you have that option. But I don't think that's available online. They had a re-release of 21H1 in November as well. I, when you go to that media creation tool, the media creation tool where you would normally download the mm -hmm. feature update, uh, if you say it's for another computer right. or another opera, or you say you're working, you tell them <laughs> you're working in a different uh, operating system, then yeah. you have a choice of downloading the last couple of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, what you would what you would download is twenty one H one, if you wanted to go that route. 
I just need to make bootable flash drives of each one so I can step them through normally. <laughs> Unless I feel like being very chancy and being prepared to re-image a machine. Well, they are cumulative. <laughs> I know they're cumulative, but it doesn't always work the same way. Oh, you're cumulative, but I forgot that one file that they forgot to put in here. Oops. Blue screen. <laughs> oh, speaking of forgetting a file. The Windows 11 installer for the for upgrading the home edition from 10 to 11 mm -hmm. is missing a file. <laughs> and it does not run on some machines. There's a Windows Secrets newsletter <laughs> free article by Fred Lango about mm -hmm. he had to make nine different attempts to upgrade a yeah, very recent vintage yeah. laptop. Yeah. <laughs> the one that he thought we'd have a problem with, he had a problem with. One he thought he was not going to have a problem with had all the problems. And the one he thought he was going to have a lot of problems with was smooth as silk. <laughs> and he thinks it's just one missing file in the installer. <laughs> so that's one reason why we're waiting for the dot one version of Windows 11. Yeah, probably safe. Although it's probably in, it already installed fine on the pro. It's on the home one that's giving them the issue. <laughs> Uh, yes and no. Uh, the home one he upgraded to Pro before trying to upgrade to 11. Right. It, 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 give me a reality check. Is undo missing from File Explorer in 11? Undo? Not that I know of. I Taylor? can't find it anywhere on the 11 machine. You used to have the little curve back arrow thing and a forward to undo. In, in File Explorer, I can't find that anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a file explorer window of a directory now. And at the top, I have new, and then I have a pair of scissors, which is cut, and then a paste thing, and uh, a, a waste basket, and a share thing, and a rename. But there is no undo. There's a view thing for layout and view options. There's nothing under there. There's a three-dot hamburger menu with things like burn to disk and select all, select none. I don't know why you'd want to select none since, okay. That's a deselect. <laughs> well, yeah, but if select none, you just click off of the stuff. And yeah. It, and it does that. And there's a properties and options. But there's, but there's nowhere I see where the undo is on it. All right, options pulled up the folder options yeah. selection with the general view and search tabs. But I don't see anything there that says like advanced settings on the view tab. I don't see an option to show undo anywhere. I mean, I've been through all of these menus. I just, I, I figured it had to be here somewhere, but, but darned if I can find it here anywhere. I mean, the one that bothers me is if you right click in a directory and you want to do a refresh, you've got to go to the secondary menu to get to the refresh option. Oops. But anyway, so it sounds like no, nobody else is either having that issue or, um, but I, I, as I said, I couldn't find it anywhere and it just boggled me that they would take that away. I mean, I accidentally copied some files to the wrong directory, and I figured just send it back. Unmute, You're muted, Tim. Tim. You're muted, Tim. Muted. Still muted. You're still muted, Tim. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Uh-huh. Right. Right. Yeah, no, it, it's not there, but it wouldn't be on an individual file for that anyway, because if I move something to a wrong directory, it isn't there for me to right click on that file. It's already in that wrong directory. Um, but what bugs me is if I right click outside of files, I have to do show more options to click on refresh to refresh the directory. When you're downloading stuff, it you have to do a refresh when it's done to see the the, the file you just downloaded like an updated installer, which is a royal pain in the butt. Somebody actually did have a, there's a registry patch you can do to revert so the file explorer shows the old options dialog instead of the new one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the end, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. That machine has to roll back to 10. It's an insider machine that doesn't meet the new requirements since it's using an old AMD chip. My X1 Lenovo tablet won't support 11. It passes every single test, except including number of cores and amount of memory and processor speed and TPM. But the processor is, a, is an M5 on the motherboard. So, sorry, you can't run 11. Need to downgrade it to a Pentium 4. There you go. <laughs> there, there, there you go. I mean, it, it is. I, I have no idea what their issue is with that. As I said, it passes cores and it passes speed and it passes memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I get it. My insider machine is running 11. They just won't allow it to be updated now. And they said, you have to roll it back to 10 again. That's what they, yeah. Well, we'll see how that one works. Yeah. Um, I see a comment that Will had, uh, brought up here. Um, I noticed he had commented, uh, whenever he plugs in some USB device into a front USB port on the PC, it reboots. And I asked him whether it was flash drives or anything. He says it's anything. Uh, if you can unmute, Will, could you tell me what happens if you plug it into the back USB ports?
Maybe he can't up up change his. Uh, that's he's muted. Yeah, I know he's muted. I was trying to get him to unmute. There he goes. So what happens when you plug into the back ports? Back ports are okay. Oh, he's got no microphone. Okay. Um, probably what you have is more than likely you have a defective port on the front that when you plug something in, it's shorting one of the power lines down and it's causing your PC to go into a power fail reboot. So you just bounce the power supply by plugging in something into that more than likely you'll need to replace the front USB ports. There are uh, things you can pull them out and replace them if you can find the same form factor. But I've seen uh, USB ports that have gotten pins mashed together and such and really crunched up good because somebody forced the flash drive in the wrong way. <laughs> and that will cause all kinds of headaches. <clears throat> The other possibility is the power supply itself may be defective. Well, he said plugging it in the back works okay. Yeah, so that eliminates that. Yeah, so I would say more than likely, um, it depends on the size. If you're just plugging in a USB flash drive and it causes your machine to reboot on the front, if there's more than one port and they all demonstrate the same problem, then there may be something wrong with the cable that's and it's rubbing against something and shorting against the case. Uh, between the connection on the front of the uh, desktop and the motherboard, because they do go back onto a little um, eight pin um, bird connector on the board. I mean, and I've seen, I, when you take apart an old PC, sometimes you can salvage some of those parts and then move it over to a new one as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions we got? New toy. An amp meter, clamp on amp meter. Yeah, I've never had, I wasn't sure it was, I, I, cause I, they were, they offered, they gave it to me for 10 bucks with some other stuff. And I, and I wondered if I could use it cause my car battery doesn't seem to necessarily be holding charge. And then I was told, no, it really won't work with DC. It only works with AC. No, that will work with DC if the, it's got the, the setting. Yeah, but for the, it it came also with with these guys. Mm -hmm. With these guys, evidently you can do DC, but you can't do it in line. No, definitely not in line. You can only right. do. But if it can do the DC with the large amperage, I mean, it's measuring a magnetic field. Right. Depends on how it's set up to do it. Not all of them support that, but. Well, how do you how do you tell there if it's able to that? Ah. Well, I, does it come with a manual or not? It comes with a with a foreign. It seems to be in a foreign language. It's a, it's sort of English, but to me, it's as a non-electrical guy, it seems to be a foreign a foreign language thing here. Um, it's the the first most of it consists of things not to do. Um, which the warnings go on for two thirds of it. Things like you have to avoid damaging meter and you should keep children away and you need to dress properly and not overreach, which is a good thing in life, I suppose, to not overreach. But Okay, uh, here, let's do this. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Right there is a clamp on ammeter. And I said, I said, clamp on DC ammeter, mm -hmm. okay? And it's twenty dollars and ninety nine cents. So obviously, they make ones that have that capability. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it should be able to do it. If it only has AC, then it is a very restrictive type of unit. Is that what it looks like? Well, I I'm looking. No. It's actually a, from a company called Sen Dash Tech. Uh huh. Um, it's just a, it's five function clamp on multimeter. What was it? A send? Send tech. C E N dash T E C H. That is a Carver Freight brand. T E C H. Yeah, that T E C H. C H. 
I can't type today. Sorry. Uh, clamp on. Yeah, yeah. It says item nine five six five two. Nine five five six five two. You can see it already was was there, but nine five six five two Centec. Mm -hmm. All right, right there. That's an eBay one. Uh, let's see if I can mm -hmm. find one from uh, Harbor Freight. Mm -hmm. Harbor Freight. That's what I th said right there. Mm -hmm. There's your owner manual in yeah, English. There's, yeah. Well, I said it's sort of English, but it's not English for people who don't know what they're doing. Uh, AC voltage, AC amps does not have DC amps. Answer is no. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. That <laughs> they they do make them though. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that actually, if you really wanted to use a multimeter to do something, and you could put something in line, um, you could take a um, a stout length of cable <laughs> and put a couple leads on either end of it. Measure the length of the cable. Figure out what the ohms of that piece of cable is. Let's say it's number eight or number six, and maybe that's like uh, like you know five feet, and I'm not sure what the uh, the ohms for that is, but it's probably like 0 0.05 or something. Well, if you've got a sense enough DC voltmeter across it, you can calculate the amps running through that by measuring the voltage drop across that piece of cable in line. Okay, basically, it's time to get a new battery. More than likely, or you take yeah. it to, uh, or if you go over to AutoZone, they'll test it for you. Well, I I, I need four tires also. So no, we can help Stone, you with the four tires at the no, battery. No, I, no, 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 <laughs> I know. But I can go to Firestone because they're across the street and get the that, and I can get the battery as one. Oh, the battery comes in 5,600 cranking power, whatever that means. And I'm not sure what the difference is and why you'd pick one over the other. 500 Except and 690? No, I don't five, think it's a, no, 5,000 and 6,900. I don't know what they would ever have 5,000 unless this thing runs a, 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 a hybrid vehicle. It, <laughs> uh, Normally, they rate wow. these things in ampere hours. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it's maybe 700 uh cranking amps and maybe about a hundred ampere hour capacity okay. i mean battery has two basically two functions okay yeah. the battery for a car has to be able to handle a surge current capable of starting your vehicle when it's cold so mm -hmm. cold cranking amp cca is a number that's usually identified on the side of the battery you want to make right. sure you at least match that um, if the physical size of the battery uh, will, uh, will accept it, you could go larger, okay? But not all batteries will fit in the same spot. You probably have like a number 24 battery or something or a modified one with or without top posts or side terminals. And that's the bis basic difference. You get what you pay for. So the bigger mm -hmm. the battery or the higher the capacity, the more you pay. You're paying for the energy in the battery. I just I just put the link to their page with the they have one called silver, one called gold, and one called platinum. And basically, the only difference between all three of those batteries, there might be minor differences of the batteries themselves, but it's mm -hmm. the warranty that they will give you before they will replace it under full charge under full well, warranty. Well, it's, it's the first one's twenty four months. The other two are both thirty six. Um, the 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 silver is 500 CCA and the silver, excuse me, the gold is 640 CCA and then the platinum is 650 CCA. So you're basically paying for additional cold cranking amps. So those are actually a little bit larger capacities or lower internal resistance. And if bungs they fit in the same spot, depends on what you want to pay for it. Does it make sense to, I mean, what do you, if, if it's a, to an older car? I mean, it's my old Rav. It's a 2002. Does it make sense to go for a 640 instead of a 500? How many years are you going to keep the car? I don't know. I would probably have replaced it now, except used car prices have gotten insane. 
Well, if you think news car prices are not going to uh, change within the next two years, then get the, the small one. Uh, how long did the Curse battery last? Four and a half years? Uh, the last battery's been in there for 12 years, 14 years. You were way overdue. Mm. You should have only done half as far. You must have very nice place where you park your car at night, and it's nice and warm, and it never has to go out in the cold. It's in my garage. Yeah, it's a good place. And if you leave it in there and you trickle charge it or whatever, keep it up every, well, start it once a week, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, but I would say, you know, you could go with any of those batteries. If okay. you're going to change it into a new car in two years, you don't want to put too much more into it. Okay. All right. I, uh... Batteries. Yeah. What's the difference in price? How long before you replace the other battery? I mean, well, I, if you go to the link in chat, it shows the price and the, the three, but uh, they're, they're not that far apart, eh? Uh, except for, uh, except it, for the platinum one it wants me to go to uh, the battery results but it's not yeah it me. probably hits me that it's not getting for my specific car it's 140 yeah. for the silver 160 for the gold and 220 for the platinum you know if, if it was really me i would go ahead and join the autozone club get my 45% off coupon and then go get the battery from them. And if it's under the hood, they will replace it for you. <laughs> I mean, I, I had to get a, uh, I have one of the AGM batteries in my 2012 Traverse, which is oh, under yeah? the back seat where oh, it's yeah. in the floor of the back seat. They won't replace that one. But when I went to go and look at the batteries, I saved like about the difference of the upgrade battery in the discount coupon when i signed up for the rewards took the discount coupon and uh, gave them another battery it didn't have to be the same battery so i just gave them a replacement battery because they want 22 dollars for the battery deposit mm -hmm. and brought the battery home and changed it in my driveway and kept the old battery hmm. okay so i mean it's it's you just, and I was even able to uh, use a trickle power supply to keep my battery, uh, the uh, settings on my radio alive while I change the battery. I'm, I'm putting it on trickle charger every night to keep it. So, because it wasn't doing a good job starting. Yeah. Um, I, had it, to, I had to put my, I have a portable booster unit that uh -huh. does a good job of starting it. You put it on there and it does really well, but I want, I didn't want to keep doing that. So the trickle charger keeps it charged up overnight. Yeah, but you are using only a fraction of that battery right now to start your car. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you any of those batteries will work. Yeah, you like I said, you can try and check on the prices like AutoZone or any of the other places that do free battery checks, uh, swaps and you'll probably save a lot of money too cuz Firestone's going to charge you to replace the battery more than likely as well in yeah. just to the price of the battery. I thought it was funny. Costco sells tires and they sell batteries, but they don't install batteries. That's why I've, for the number of years since I uh, discovered them, I've been going to discount tire. Because uh, once you get your, your they have one of the best prices out there for any of the tires you're going to buy, as long as it's one of their stock item, items. Mm -hmm. Even if it isn't stock, they might have it at another store. Mm -hmm. But for the life of your tires that you've purchased, you get free puncture repair, auto ro uh, tire rotation, mm -hmm. uh, anything that needs to be done, it's on them. Mm -hmm. So, so much for the uh, the uh, small you know, commercial here. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, meanwhile, I'll look at the AutoZone website and see what it's I mean, they're down. They're down the street from me. They're about yeah, five blocks. Just, just check in on see if you can get a better price on them. And like I said, if you join the rewards, sometimes they send you the 25 or 55% coupon or whatever it was. They always try mm -hmm. to they entice me to buy something else. So, mm -hmm. and I have sales resistance. So, <laughs> okay. it's a good test. All Any right, other thanks. questions? Okay, no hands up. All right, so maybe I should go into my presentation. Okay, let's see it. the share screen. Let's see if I can find the right one. Share. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Virtual private networking. 
as I mentioned uh, earlier on the meeting before most of you have joined, um, this isn't exactly the newest information. Uh, I did almost a similar version last year at this time, but I've updated some portions of it and added some more content. So it's not completely uh, re retread of the same presentation. So first of all, <clears throat> VPN, virtual private network. What does it do? It allows you to connect between two internet locations to function as if they were co-located. And along the way, the connection as it goes through the internet is resistant to snooping uh, or even knowing what the information is because it's encrypted. And both the setup of the connection and the data transferred are both encrypted. So they, if they try and start capturing at the beginning of the session to try and figure out something, it's usually unsuccessful. Um, where do you use VPNs? It's almost required from many employers if you want to access the core network of the corporation that you have to use some sort of VPN software to access the main servers or to share content, uh, even getting email. Uh, normally, these services are not available outside the business um, and, and they're protected with pretty much an industrial grade firewall. Does it require hardware? Um, they do require some hardware, but most of it's on the host end as part of the infrastructure. Um, you can have Juniper firewall products that handle thousands of simultaneous connections. Uh, sometimes they're integrated with key fobs, uh, or if you don't have the key fob, you can have it as a software product that runs on your computer. And basically, when you run it, it will automatically handshake with the fixed end with a uh, code that changes every 30 seconds and on the software token. And that's what uh, helps restrict somebody from spoofing or getting into the system if it's not you. Uh, on a hardware only VPN, um, you use this between two remote locations that want to have access to each other's servers. So this can be used using the internet rather than a dedicated uh, least line of some sort or dedicated uh, pair of copper if it's, uh, if it's short distances or fiber if it's longer distance. Um, they can use a hardware VPN to share the internet as the backhaul between these two locations. Um, the hardware on the remote end would allow more than one computer to utilize the VPN, which is then shared between the two locations and servers on the host location can be accessed by remote devices. So you can use this when they're demonstrating commercial products at a customer location by bringing in a hardware device and then plugging the customer's uh, units into it and then sort of showing how they're part of the entire cloud. When the remote PC browses the internet, all of his non-local IP uh, traffic is directed to the host location, which then can go through the internet to the firewall. And I think I got a picture on the next. So this is basically what you have. So you have a, a, a one of these two PCs can go through a hardware VPN through the router and then go to the host side and then access the host servers or actually come back out to the internet again using the address of the host end as the source. So when you're using a VPN between two locations, you need the VPN server running some sort of compatible VPN software and a client side VPN client to run on your computer, which wants to connect to that the VPN via the internet. So you need a VPN client, you talk to a VPN server. So if you're at, you know, you want to, uh, your work and you want to access your home network and print something on your home printer, if you happen to have a VPN setup that your home router supports, like OpenVPN, which is built in on a couple of the Linksys routers, you could have OpenVPN. And if you were allowed to run OpenVPN client on your work computer, you could basically tie into your home system <coughs> and transfer the information. Assuming the ports are opened and you have the right credentials, not all work situations would allow it, but let's say you're someplace at a coffee shop and you forgot to get a file off your home server, you could use the same technique to get files off your home server. And that's pretty easy to do, okay? So you set up your home network with your open VPN server. And then when you access, you're over here at the coffee shop and you access through their network, through the internet to your home machine, it appears as if your machine is over on the left side now. 
that's the logical place where you're at. And you end up with another IP address that would look like it's on this LAN. And that's where, if you access the internet again, it would look like you're at home. So if you use a VPN to access your home system, you could fool Comcast into thinking that you're really at home when you're not. And then it would allow you to stream content there. Now you can also use a VPN for anonymous internet as you subscribe to a commercially available service to allow a remote PC to access the internet without disclosing its location or local IP address. This is a software only solution and typically only on the PC and uh, you don't necessarily get any of the local peripherals. Um, why this function is, this is functionally what a commercial VPN example showed previously. The only purpose of this VPN service is to hide the local IP address from the inspection of internet traffic from the remote server. So the IP address that be reported by a remote PC would be typically be the address of the VPN server and be a port forwarding uh, off of that one of those. So um, it would uh, basically look like a, a port on that network. You only need the VPN client software running on the computer wishing to use anonymous access. What you might need or may be built in would be something called split tunnel operation. Why do you want to have split tunnel available? Well, if you're accessing through the VPN on the internet, and you want to go print something, you want to make sure it goes to my printer rather than somewhere's on the host VPN. Split tunnel allows you, allows the network router function within your computer to know, oh, this is going to the local address. Don't go through the VPN software. Just send it out the Ethernet port and it'll get there. If it's an address, anything other than the local network, it always goes to the VPN software and is forwarded to the remote end. So basically, this is what happens. You're here, you access your host VPN. It looks like you're over here to everybody on the internet. And here's where you end up, your, your presence looks. So your PC appears to be coming from this paid VPN server IP address. And usually it's harder to snoop something like that. If your local guy is Comcast here, it's probably not Comcast over in China where your VPN server might be. Of course, then anybody who's on this VPN server can see anything they want of all your traffic going back and forth. So you have to be a little careful with that. So not all VPN suppliers are domestic source. Many are in other countries and I'm putting parentheses China and I'm referring to the big one, not the little one. Okay, Terry finally got here. Uh, before selecting a VPN, you may need to decide what information will be used to the VPN and limit your exposure with the data that, that will be exchanged. You may not want to put everything through the VPN. You probably don't want to access your bank information through a VPN, unless you're at a coffee shop and you want to try and protect some of it. But usually there's enough protection in most places as long as you have a semi-secure method. <coughs> Many secure sites may block access to their site when you use a VPN and may require a two-factor authentication. What happened to my... Uh... What's what the happened? question? Why are you asking me? Oh. Why are you asking right. me? Let, me? let me do this. Uh, all right. Oh. Taken care of. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> all right. So uh, many secure sites... If you try and access it from this VPN, which might be way down in China or India or maybe in the British Virgin Isles, who knows where, um, they will probably require two-factor authentication and want to hit your phone to make sure, are you really here at this address? But I wouldn't trust it to use my bank information unless I really, really trusted this VPN supplier. Do you need to open ports on your local router to use VPN? Typically, only the host would need to open most of the specific ports to allow a VPN connection to exist on a remote endpoint. Um, if you use a router, you may have to poke some holes in it. If you use Windows Firewall, you may have to open these ports, 443 and 1194. 
Otherwise, your VPN will not play too well with it. What does it cost to use a VPN? Other than the subscription cost, there is a penalty to using a VPN. VPNs typically use encryption. Better encryption protocols to use larger keys. Larger the keys, the slower the link utilization. It takes a lot of horsepower to crank on a large key. And this is for all information that you're sending back and forth, whether it's your, your username or password, or you're sending in a video file, it's going to be encrypting the entire thing. 256-bit key is usually more than enough for most encryption, unless you're trying to do something that might be involving Homeland Security, in which case you already are using something a lot bigger and you're paying the penalty. Uh, for very secure connections, you might only be in the 20 to 60 megabit throughput when you turn up that key, even if you have a very fast processor, because the other end has to have an equivalent processor to maintain those speeds. And the other thought, would do you trust your VPN provider? All of your information going through their servers is unencrypted while it's in the server. <clears throat> so if somebody needed to tap it at a low level, they are perfectly able to do so. Where is your VPN provider located? Uh, British Virgin Islands, Great Britain, Panama, Romania, mainland China. The last two I would really worry about. I get too much spam from there and I'm sure it might be from some people using VPNs on their system and not being careful what they're doing. Do you actually need a VPN? Okay, well that's the question on what you would like to not show to the outside world. If you're, use, if you're just trying to download some information and you don't want that information disclosed and it's in the file, you can always use secure FTP between two servers. And when you use secure FTP, <coughs> it's pretty fast, okay? Secure FTP with a 256-bit key, you can get in the 160 to 240 megabit per second throughputs. Not uncommon. Um Using browsers that limit your uh, searches and information retrieval sources can also reduce your exposure. You know, using DuckDuckGo is a big step forward. Using an incognito me mode on a Chrome browser with DuckDuckGo is better. Okay. And uh, the other things. If there's the one incognito browser with DuckDuckGo. All of a sudden, the things you start searching for won't show up on your Facebook feed. Uh, making sure you almost exclusively use uh, HTTPS sites. Um, sending your real sensitive information via email can be done with out-of-band password exchange and encrypted files. Uh, commercial communications use secure mail servers to limit exposure to unauthorized users. So they're not actually sending the information through uh, email, but they will send a link and then you will call into their server and download via a secure mechanism to get the proprietary information you're trying to request. And if you really want truly anonymous browsing, then I would suggest migrating temporarily to either a bootable USB running Tails, which is the Onion Router project. And that's basically what I had for VPNs. So now I will open the floor to questions. <clears throat> Say uh, onion router. Onion router. Uh, it's a project that's been around for a long time. It in, involves um, a Linux-like operating system called Tails. Um, what Onion does is it takes your information and sends it through the Onion router network. So it's basically randomized as to the source and destination points. It knows how to get back to you from wherever you go, but anybody trying to track you is going to go into a cloud. So you might be one instance in San Francisco and the next instance you'll be in Great Britain. So anybody watching your traffic is going to get terribly confused until they realize it's going through the onion router. And all the information is already encrypted as well. So it makes it even harder to, to snoop. But if you ever need to do a dark web search, that's the thing you want to use. Although you may yes, want to software, do it on another machine without a hard drive in it. <laughs> software that you put on your machine then to do that? 
you download the tail os from their website okay. and you install it to using two usb drives one to put the raw information on for the first and the first one creates the second usb drive and you boot up using the second usb drive and then basically you're not storing anything on this machine it's basically a secure browser you don't read email because re reading email identifies you to some worse but if you're browsing and you're just looking and stuff for in websites and uh, you're able to send other information without having to log in, totally anonymous. That's the way they want it. If you want more information, I might be able to dig out a presentation once I did for uh, using Tails OS. Or we can redo it again sometime if somebody's interested. Other questions? Terry, you're muted. Still muted, Terry. Earth to Terry, you're still muted. I see his mouth moving. <laughs> uh, unmute. Okay. Yeah. Um, and can you send me the PowerPoint? We, you know, we've got one Glenn office. We're all up a second office, and you know, if we can VPN, uh, the problem is, you know, with the federal tax stuff, you know, they only want one server. Uh, so if we have a second office and, and we can just, you know, use the server in one office, you know, the, the government doesn't like, uh, you know, two different, uh, you know, servers or whatever. So I, I think maybe we can do a VPN with, with the new office to our, our main office. Well, you'll have to discover how you do uh, open VPN and setting it up if that's what you want to use. The, pre the presentation, the PDF is now available through, through chat. Oh, it is? Yeah, I just put it there. Yep. Yeah, because we're yeah, we're looking, uh, the problem, well, everything's okay, but, but the problem is. Well, do you, what, kind of, what kind of router do you have at the one location? Uh, is it a Linksys, high-end Linksys, 1900? I, I, I got to bring in our, our real tech guy for that. Well, what you need to do is find out whether or not OpenVPN is supported on that router. If it's already supported on that router, all you'll need is the OpenVPN client on the remote machine, and then he can log in and pretend he's on your local network. The yeah, problem is accountants don't, they don't want accountants using different servers, you know, so uh, that, that, that's the problem, you know. With the, uh, I, that's what I said. It'll look at, like it's coming from your location. That's what we want. Yeah. So we, I mean, you know, and actually it, I can just do the returns at the second office and, you know, that's what, that's what open the, VPN yeah, the, does. Yeah, open VPN home office. Yeah. Open VPN is open source VPN. So you run it on your router or on a host machine that can go it's on a DMZ to your router and then he can play router. Um, and then the other machine can log in through that and basically look like he's a local client on that network. Beautiful. That's what we need. Yeah. Keep the IRS happy. <laughs> Pardon? How do you test or find out if your router will use OpenVPN? What is it you have to do? Well, look in the specifications for your router or crack open the router installation manual and see whether or not it supports OpenVPN. Or you can do a web search and say, what routers support OpenVPN? Okay. I mean, that's just one way of doing it. Okay, what routers support OpenVPN? Uh, Linksys WRT3200ACM with DDWRT. Uh, Asus 5300, Netgear 6400, all running DDWRT. You don't need to run DDWRT uh, on the router. You can get it built in on some other Linksys routers as well in the standard load. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on, let's see, Linksys. Uh, the ones that automatically support it on Linksys smart Wi-Fi routers, WRT3200ACM, WRT1900AC, WRT1900ACS, and WRT1200AC. So there's four Linksys routers that do support that.
Hopefully that answered your question. Yes, Sid. Few few things. I was going to ask for the slides. Thanks for doing that. Um, I do not know about the accounting rules, even though I have an accounting degree. I got out of accounting when I was really, the hair was darker. <laughs> banking, <laughs> banking, banking regs, though, will not allow you to do an open VPN type thing. It, it's not allowed on banking regulations, which I have looked at. I don't know about accounting regulations. You, you cannot do an encryption between even machines of your own under the banking regulations. <laughs> yeah, but, banking but is again, separate. Yeah, banking yeah, is but separate. But again, I don't, I don't know under the accounting rules. I have run ob open, D open VPN setups between my notebook and home machine so I could be remotely and, and tunnel back to my office. It, it took me about three weeks of keying and coding and playing to actually make it work right. It, the exercise is left for the student. Yeah, it, it's not the easiest <laughs> setup in the world. It, 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 there's a lot of configuring to do to make it work and to make it work through your firewalls on both sides, which also right. takes a lot of time to get those ports correct. That's um, why I identified those two ports. Those two definitely have to be open. Some other ones might need to be open. Yeah. And it also depends on uh, what you use for your... Um, Network resolution protocol. It, it, so your it's DNS a, lookup, open yeah, DNS, a, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot to play with, but it is it is doable. I run two different DNSs here. I have fastest VPN and I have Surfshark. Uh, before that, I use CyberGhost. Um, they all have pluses and minuses. Many of them actually use Open DNS in the background under their client. They will they will fork and if you look at their license agreement, it will have fine print of the open source stuff they're using because they're required to actually say that yeah. uh, in their license. And a lot of the, the VPN guys <laughs> actually don't want to reinvent the wheel. And yeah. so they will use open DNS as their as a back end. So they um, use open DNS, not open VPN as part of their product? Open VPN. I okay. I Right. I, I was one of the original beta testers for Open DNS mm -hmm. when they started up, and they have a pseudo VPN on Open DNS. They're now owned by Cisco, of course, and they they actually have a, a pseudo VPN where they will change the address without running a client. They'll do it at their back end by using by knowing checking who you are by your login to them. Um, and then they'll flip it on the fly, which is a little bit lighter than running a VPN client, but not quite as, as good in, in doing that. It depends what you want to do. Uh, the fastest VPN, which is on this notebook, is interesting because they run these deals. It was $30 for lifetime. Um, li I assume lifetime to be three years on those deals. <laughs> I, I never, never assume lifetime means they're going to be around for a lifetime. Does that I mean just, you're sharing your information with all of Belarus? <laughs> no, no. Meanwhile, Surfshark is is monthly, and uh, CyberGhost was monthly. You ever yeah. check to see where their servers are? Yeah, both of those guys have hundreds of servers, um, and you can even uh, Surfshark lets you do double hop VPN. You can actually pick different cities, and it'll encrypt hop through two different locations. Um, if you're super paranoid, and if you're really triply super paranoid, you can you can actually run it through Tor. As an extra, <laughs> as an extra hop. Okay. Um, why you do that? Your performance would suck, but it would be then triple in triple protect sort of. Well, they do have triple DES encryption options for some um, hardware VPN solutions. So they do, then it actually encrypts it three times. That means yeah. you got to decrypt it three times as well. Yeah, I mean, I know people who back up to the cloud. And they run an encryption of what they send up to the cloud just because they don't trust sending their data up directly to the cloud. So you're, it depends how, how paranoid you want to be 
And when it comes down to it in the end, there's very little you can do if somebody wants to get at your data these days. Yeah. In case you're wondering, Wayne, TOR stands for the Onion Project. Yeah. Actually, the Onion Router officially, yeah. but that, yeah. that's what the acronym is. Yeah. Um, the only problem with TOR now is, for instance, the government has cracked it pretty well now. They know the exit points and, in, and therefore they can now almost always tie from where you went to where it comes out. Yeah, they can do it, but they're also using a substantial acreage of machines yeah. in uh, near Alexandria to figure out that answer. And yeah. you have to be doing something that would put you on their radar for them to start looking. Well, your words just now were probably picked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden I just saw an email come in from you know, Homeland <laughs> Security. Please do not change any of your files. <laughs> Yay, big brother. Yay, big brother. Yay, big brother. <laughs> well, I, I know they, they track wire transfers because we had a, a guy years ago that told the IRS that he never, you know, shipped money overseas. Well, when he had not been court, you know, they had every wire that he had done, you know, <laughs> they had him on a list and he couldn't believe it, you know. They they track all those wires, especially overseas, you know. Well, they can track them just as easily as you can send them. Yeah. If you can send it easily, they can track it easily. You know, the government was that sophisticated. Well, they, you know, they they know where he sent the money. If they have, uh, if they have money, they think that you owe them. They will find a way to make sure they liberate it. Well, I mean, you're talking two different sophistications: sophistication and reading data flowing. But it's more, it's easier than that. The banking requirements make the banks report all this stuff. Oh, yeah. Wire transfers over 3,000. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, well, there's a subsection of that. They don't talk, you don't hear much. It's if you do a lot of small transactions, they're required to report that because people were trying to get around it by doing lots of under the threshold transactions. Well, yeah. If, if, if there's a lot of transactions and the banks uh, think it's suspicious, yeah. I've had banks question when I had to do some transactions for my brother and they wondered, where did you get all this cash from? Well, I had to cash in some of his gold coins <laughs> and I did and made two deposits of five. And uh, that was enough to trigger the question. Mm -hmm. Like, where did this come from? We've liquidated some assets. He needed to pay bills. <laughs> okay. We're good with that. <laughs> Yeah, I I mean, it, somebody was saying in some of the Scandinavian countries, the tax form is one side of one page. You basically sign it, and that's about it because their computers know all your income and all your and all your other stuff, and so it's one side of one page. Well, there's a cost for free health care. <laughs> well, well, and the other tax stuff they do is VAT, which is also baked in. So they don't have you don't have to look at it directly. Well, and now yeah, Dennis, they uh, come up with this FinCEN where you had your return, you got admit, you know, they, uh, you know, then if you don't, you know, they catch it, you know, and they don't have, and you don't, you know, uh, they go get and go get you for for that to ever doing a FinCEN. Yeah. Remember, three years, but then it can go back forever if they think it's fraud. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know. Go, all these guys taking them trips to the Hamas, you know, go visit their money. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dennis, you had a question. In the presentation, you mentioned the secure FTP. Now, yes. isn't, that, isn't that only between two specific sites? I mean, explain that a little bit more, though. If your site supports secure FTP, that's an option you can use in FileZilla client. If you so log in and say, I only want to use secure FTP, and then it'll ask, it'll download the site certificate from the host side, and now it'll then maintain a secure connection whenever you connect and download. So anybody trying to see what you're downloading is going to be, have to go through a lot of extra measures to try and break it. So, so is that something you're saying I can do on my 
personal laptop here at home to someone else's personal laptop at their house? Uh, if they have FileZilla host on their machine and you have FileZilla client on your machine and you've opened the right holes in your firewall, yes. FileZilla is just software I put on yeah. my machine? Yeah. FileZilla is open source uh, okay. software. You, it comes in two flavors, host and server. Uh, server, I'm sorry, and client. But for the server to be seen, you have to have a port open so that it can either slide through and then do the, what you would want to do probably is if your router supports what's called the DMZ, you would take your machine that you want to share the information, put it on the DMZ so its ports are exposed to the internet and allow him to go through your main um, port, your main access to be able to reach. And then you could start, you have the, the FTP ports open that are needed by FileZilla. I don't remember all of those on the top of my head, but you would open up the secure FTP ports and then it would log in, handshake, password, username, and then you would choose the files that you want to transfer, boom, 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 and away they go. Hmm. I mean, the, the, you want the poor man way of doing it, though. Poor man way of doing it is real simple. Put your stuff into a big zip file, password protect it with a big password, upload it to Google, and let the other guy download it. You can do 17 gigabytes at a time that way. <laughs> I mean, if you have a short number of files, but if you have what's known as a seed server that's downloading torrents and something, and you want to transfer it to your machine and it's primarily one direction, most of the seed servers support secure FTP. So once you log secure FTP up, you can download with uh, pretty much impunity anything you wanted. And that way it keeps, if your seed server is outside the uh, continental US, um, basically nobody's going to be snooping around that or they can snoop all they want, but they're not going to do anything about it. And if that seed server gets compromised, they'll get a seed server in a different country. Let them go look for that. I think my last one that we used was uh, Canada. And I think we're in the Netherlands now. Other questions? Wow, you're all silent. You're ready to start teaching other people about VPNs now, right? <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have a question on a different subject, but I'm, I'm, I'll sit here and wait. I was looking at utility. I put the link in chat, um, and it, it sounds like what it does is useful, but every time I see one of these things, I wonder if they're really – it's like registry cleaners. You always wonder – if they actually accomplish anything particularly useful, what does it do? It oh, it act it it's it freshens your SSD. How and do you yes, how I, do you freshen an SSD? And and yes, I appreciate that it, it isn't really freshened. But what they're saying they do in terms of settings, I have to wonder. For instance, they turn off timestamps on files because they say. Windows keeps setting that on every access, and that's not good for an SSD. They, they also change kernel swapping, and they do a bunch of, of other setting changes. Well, that sounds like if you start turning off time stampings, if you ever have a error and you have to try and recover the NTFS file system, you're going to fail. Because the journey is not going to yeah. match the files. That's why I'm asking. That's why I'd be very hesitant about doing anything like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one thing you can count on is if you have an SSD, make sure you size it so it's like two to three times your largest amount you're ever going to use. And then count on replacing it in about four and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they also turn off prefetch. Because they say SSDs are fast enough to do it, that prefetch doesn't help. 
Yeah, but the, uh, the prefetch is, is is basically moot because all it's doing is loading it into memory in anticipation mm -hmm. of the processor using it. And depending on the speed of the SSD bus into the computer, it might be beneficial or it might not be. If it's an M2 drive, it might be fast enough or it might be, you know, something else. You know, it might, if it's a regular conventional uh, SATA 6 okay. gig, you know, it might, it might help. They, they turn off storing as short names. No, that's marginal. <clears throat> they, they deactivate Windows event logging. That's serious. Windows event logging? Yeah, because then now you can no longer trace some things. I mean, it's, it's minutia in some places, and maybe mm -hmm. it's significant in others, but I, you're not going to get another two years of life out of an SSD. If you really are paranoid about an SSD wearing out, then don't store, don't boot your system off of it. Boot off of a conventional hard drive and let it beat that to death and deal with the slower access. Put your stuff that you need to access on the SSD when you need it, and you can get it quick enough. But, I mean, you can put the swap drive and the boot drive on a hard drive, and you can put other things on an SSD. I mean, you can play games trying to figure out which is better. Okay. I, recently, I heard like one source they started calling old style hard drives rust drives. What did they call them? Rust drives. West drives? Rust, no, rust, like rusty. Rust drives? Yeah. Uh, well, technically, it is iron oxide, but yeah. I wouldn't call it rust. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it was on Tom's Hardware. There was an article, and they were calling them rust drives. Well, I could call an SS3 drive a sand drive then. There you go. <laughs> it's all silicon. <laughs> and if you oxidize the silicon, it's sand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, Sid, what you're noticing, what Ablesoft is doing, is they're automating some uh, setup, that, some setup that used to be recommended back when SSDs were very fragile. And uh, they used to wear out a lot more easily than they do now. Uh, on a modern hard on a modern SSD, from what I've been reading in other articles, all these things that you used to have to do, except for over provisioning, are really no longer recommended because mm -hmm. they really just don't do that much good. Yeah. <laughs> And then if you look at the, when you look at your SSDs, the brand of your SSD is going to probably say a lot about it as well. Uh, oh, and one, one other thing that you do want to do, you want to be able to trim the SSD. That right. should happen automatically, periodically. But in case it doesn't, you might want to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in Windows, uh, you want to make sure that Windows is seeing that SSD as an SSD, so it isn't trying to optimize it, but it's going to trim it. Yeah, my old, no, my old Windows server, which was the old small business server, I have to run the Intel trim utility on it to do the trim. Right. Uh, that depends on what's in the controller. I And I think I already have uh, told this group or other CCS groups several times about external enclosures, and some of them don't pass the trim command. Others do. They need to be UASP compliant, and so does your operating system, and so do all of your interfaces. Hmm. Otherwise, you will be putting a bit more wear and tear on the SSD if it's in an enclosure. Good to know. Good to know. And there only are about two or three different kinds of controllers in these enclosures that allow passing of the trim command mm -hmm. or something. It's not really the trim command. It's something similar. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bob. I didn't know that. Yeah. So if you buy, if you buy like a pre-made external SSD, it may or may not be able to pass the trim command. Mm -hmm. It may be made for data, not for running mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
And I had to, I actually had to change enclosures to get mine, uh, my SATA uh, SSD set up to work properly in an external enclosure for trim. Hmm. Does it, does it matter if the drives bit locker encrypted? And no, there's, there's other problems with that. I, <laughs> Kiss your data goodbye. <laughs> if you have, if you have anything that's USB and you're using BitLocker, you're probably also using TPM. And that means you have to enter a passcode every time you plug in or try yeah, to boot do. from yeah. the external enclosure. Mm -hmm. or the external device. Mm -hmm. Every external device you plug in, you have to put in that code or you have to have something like a YubiKey. Yeah, I, I have both, but my my code for BitLocker is 22 random characters long and it's, it's a lot of typing in. <laughs> yeah, that's why you might want to consider a dongle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a YubiKey also. But I, I mean, I think the key on some of these, you want to say, well, <clears throat> what is the lifetime number of terabytes written on your heart on your SSD and see, compare it with what you have and what you think you might want to get. I think when I bought these Samsung 860 ZVOs, um, they were pretty much top of their game. I know there's probably other ones out there, but for a 500 gigabyte drive, I think it was. Two point no twenty four hundred terabytes written or something, which you'll hit probably in about four and a half years. <laughs> Does it? How much difference is it to the new enterprise class SSD? Ah, uh, depends on what they're using. I think the enterprise SSDs. Uh, some of them aren't even aren't even SSDs. They're nothing more than battery backed up uh, RAM. Hmm. If you're really concerned about updates, lifetimes, and such, they just do massive amounts of RAM with a built-in battery backup. Of course, and then, of and then if the power fails, they roll it off to other storage hmm. mechanisms, and then they roll it back in again when power is restored. Hmm. Massive memory array. In yeah. a way, none of this matters. This morning was the semi-annual Intel uh, conference, virtual conference. It was this morning. And the presenters were, and supply services, this isn't available, and this isn't available, and this isn't available, and this may be available next year, and we don't know when this is going to be available. It's well, available we have, if you want to pay for air freight. Yeah, That's yeah, it. Yeah, but we have a few of these left. The rest of them are in a boat off of Long Beach. <laughs> Here's the number of the storage container. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was impressed that they did talk about Apple and M1s and, and ARM chips, and they did talk about the stuff AMD is doing. And they said, basically, we're not blind. We see what's going on. And we intend to answer it. And I was impressed with that, that they took that head on. That's not something Intel has always done. Uh, well, they have their that. fabs but, all over the place, yeah. but the supply chain problem exists on both coasts. It's not yeah. just yeah. the West Coast. It's just as bad in Florida. And I suspect it's as bad in the uh, other Eastern ports as well. But I know some of their fabs are, some of the stuff they're doing is fabbed in Israel. Of course, that doesn't do well if you want to buy chips in Saudi Arabia. Well, and, and of course, some of it is just they can't manufacture them as fast as they're needed. True. I mean, it's not just supply chain. It's, it's they can't make them fast enough. It's like all the NVIDIA stuff is going to the people that want to uh, do uh, Bitcoin harvesting. <laughs> and, and Teslas and cars are using incredible numbers of chips now. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's why there's problems and people put it on autopilot and is it, well, you're missing a couple of chips. <laughs> well, they rejiggered Tesla's to use fewer different chips in the latest revs, evidently, for that reason, to work around availability of some of what they were using before. I wonder how much uh, electronics were in the uh, electric Hummer that uh, Biden was driving around yesterday. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But you got smart TVs with lots of chips. I mean, that's the problem. All Everything's using these now. And, and they all want to come over from the boat. And uh, there's only so many boats that have made it. And what you're seeing is stuff from last year, probably. Well, I mean, urgent stuff they can fly in. I was at an ASI online thing, and they made the point of the shortages are especially going to be in the low-end items. Because if you have a limited number of chips, why bother to put them in low-end items? Put them in the high-end items instead. So their statement was you're going to have much easier time getting the high-end items than the low-end items. Right. So somebody's going to pay extra to get it here. Well, again, you can fly them. I mean, it's pretty it's expensive but you can fly them with stuff's really urgent mm-hmm. okay all right uh let's see checking my time here um i know that normally this group does not meet on the third thursday in december because it's so close to christmas um that i'm going to probably continue that uh tradition unless somebody else is uh, desirous to uh, wanting to run the meeting but um, anybody uh, else uh, have a similar thought silence I, I, Dennis nod your head thank you <laughs> yeah, we, we've usually skipped the last several years so yeah yeah fine. okay well and usually it's, it, it, yeah yeah, APCU's done that for years. We do. We've always done the combined November December lunch, and right? Left it at that, but yeah. Because I don't uh, think there's going to be too many Christmas buffets. I <laughs> uh, actually, South Suburban is having their Christmas party, and I everybody is welcome. I don't know about that. Another super what? spreader. Twenty first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Are they doing masks when they're not eating? 21st. Let me check that. You, of December, right? Yeah. 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 See, I could never meet that anyway because I already have a standing meeting on that date. But it's like me... in Chicago Heights or something, isn't it? It's it's a drive. Yes. I think it's like about 10 miles past where Jesus dropped his sandals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a dad joke. That's yeah. my dad joke. <laughs> yeah. Get off the of 294 at the Dixie exit. And you're and right try, there. You're only a couple <laughs> blocks from it. And try not to get shot. Yeah, I know. Uh, my, my armor is a little on the thin side. Okay. You know so that there has been shootings are, are north of the uh, loop yep. areas now, north and northwest and west. Oh, there have been shootings all over. There have been shootings in Palatine. And in uh, almost Buffalo Grove, between Buffalo Grove and Palatine, there was a uh, running gun battle on uh, between two cars on uh, the 53 extension as they came up to Lake Cook. Right. Kind of strange seeing, you know, hearing something like that, like, okay, or you hear pop, 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 and is it, that's not fireworks. <laughs> Palatine, where they had that brown fried chicken mess up there in uh, Palatine or whatever. I was going to that particular brown fried chicken when I find out they're closed. And it was on that Sunday, too. Wow. Wow. Yep. Smith Road and 14. Mm-hmm. They, they, uh, there's another brown's chicken that's opened in Palatine. Took them a long time to open it. It's. Uh, about a mile and a half, no, well, not quite a mile, uh, down the strip uh, cl- where 14 bends over where the Ace Hardware is. So uh, there's one there that I frequent, but I uh, used to go there all the time, and then all of a sudden, I closest Browns is another 10 miles farther. Wow. 
Yeah, the family that ran it no longer runs it anymore. They did try and bring it back, but for a bit, and then they sold out. Yeah, wow. But there's been uh, other shootings on uh, Baldwin and Rand Road. Um, that, uh, like I said, there's a couple places. Um, and up farther, Baldwin and uh, 68, there's a couple areas around there where People think that's what you do when you converse, you shoot at each other. <clears throat> but there's been carjackings too. Oh, a lot of those too. Yeah. There were two that I know of in Schomburg. And then they take the cars and uh, commit crimes downtown. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not easy to do. I had a flat tire and getting it up on that jack was not easy. <laughs> One of those rotating cranky things that you keep cranking and cranking and cranking and cranking. And cranking. <laughs> I couldn't jack that well for the thing. Oh, <laughs> you know, there is a secret to doing that. If you have a scissors jack, Sid, mm -hmm. what you need to do is have a uh, 18 volt impactor and uh, three quarter inch uh, socket set and then and it just <laughs> brings it right up. If I had that, I'd just have a hydraulic lift thing. Yeah, but it's so. a lot easier to carry this around when you need it in the middle of nowhere. Because <laughs> once I got it up, then I couldn't get the bolts loose. So, it didn't so that's the secret. You never were trained when your father told you how to change a tire is you loosen the lot, the, the nuts while it's still on the ground, and I then you jack it up and you take it all the way off. Except the only thing I had was the standard handle that has the thing in the end, and I couldn't get the leverage to actually get it loose. When the, when the guy came from the service thing, he had one of these huge T things that right away, but I couldn't get it loose for any, and I tried jumping on it, and I'm not a small guy, and I couldn't. Get uh, the it secret on that is a four foot section of water pipe, and you put that over the end of your engine. <laughs> <laughs> then it snaps off the bolt. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, the the other thing that they uh, they do when they go out to remove one is they may bring penetrating oil with them and just squirt it right on the lug nuts first, and let that sit that. for a little bit. Yeah, I did that. It didn't didn't help. You didn't use PV blaster. Probably not. That's Probably the, that's the not. good stuff. It stinks mm -hmm. like hell, but that's the good stuff. That'll seep into anything. I imagine if you put it on the bottom of a hard drive, it would seep into the bearings there, and then you'd never be have to worry about reading that hard drive again. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There, yeah. There you go. I mean, there was a person shot and killed across the street from my house. So at the Walgreens, so you you never you I mean you never you never know. It turned out they knew each other. It's always yeah. good to shoot somebody you know. I suppose. <laughs> and keep it in the family. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's a sad state when you have to say that's what our our society is going through right now. But hopefully, we think that some of us are in a little bit better class than uh, some of the other people that are out there. Well, you heard about that whole crew that uh, swiped all the stuff over at that Louis Vuitton there in Oak Brook. Oh, yeah. And and where did they catch him on the way home? Yep. Mm -hmm. Three different cars. Yep. And they didn't realize they were all under surveillance at the time. Yeah. Was that the one that happened either yesterday or today? Last, yesterday afternoon. Yep. Okay. Five o'clock in the afternoon. Jeez. That, that, that takes guts, you know, driving through traffic in Oak Brook at that time of night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you're in the parking lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can't move anywhere, even in the back roads. I used to use the back roads, the spring road to go to Oak Brook Terrace. I used to live probably about four miles away from there. Yep. That's a, yeah, that was always the thing of using ways. Ways will take you down every little lane and side street possible to save a minute. Yeah. No, I haven't tried that, but I remember some of those things back when there was a quarry over there and a bunch of other things on that back road. Because uh, I recall when Oak Brook Terrace was open fields. Yeah. That's a long time ago. You're getting old. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm old. I'm getting old. I'm getting older by the second. So any suggestions for future meetings? We did the VPN. Anybody else got any requests? Hmm. Kathy, no requests. I'm thinking. <laughs> you see the steam coming out? <laughs> I, was, I can't smell anything, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I I suppose while you're thinking of that, anybody have any any pointers to good Black Friday deals? Because I haven't seen very many good deals on anything this year. Yeah, and I think they're going to hold their cards close and uh, just try and do enough to outdo each other, and that's about it. They're not going to really knock the price down on anything that they can make money on because they have limited supplies. If they had uh, like a warehouse full of these items, great. But if you have 10 instead of 100, you're going to try and sell them for full price because you're not going to get any more after they're gone. I mean, I hate to think what they're going to do at Costco when they run out of TVs. Has anybody tried these uh, Amazon Fresh things yet? Or I guess they got uh, Kisco's where you, you go in and you say, I want carrots, it tells you what aisles it in or what location or whatever they were saying or something. I can do that on my Walmart app. <laughs> I frequently do when I can't find something. Oh, it's an A9. Oh, I'm an A19. Uh, Home, Depot, <laughs> Home Depot gives bin number and aisle number on yeah. stuff. But and then you go there and they're out of it. A lot of yeah, a lot of a lot of times. I, I mean, now, hello for us. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You have three left. No, you don't. <laughs> they're gone. I yeah. checked. Yeah. Well, that's always on the big specials, especially at Walmart. The employees take them, and the computer system says, we still have a few, except the employees take them first. Yeah. So they're really, yeah. not, they're really not there. They don't steal them. They'll check them out, but they'll put them under another code uh, to, to get the deal on them, and therefore the computer says, we still have a few. No, you don't. Yeah, they're, they're they're gone, and there's there's no easy way to deal around that. Uh, but yeah, I was looking at the computers coming for Black Friday. I mean, the deal computers are outrageously pricey right now. Somebody's nice. doing. I think Walmart's doing a hundred and thirty nine dollars Celeron notebook. Well, oh somebody God. was selling some sort of seventeen inch laptop on Facebook mm -hmm. for like ninety seven dollars, and I'm thinking this has got to be a scam. I mean, there was okay. a couple of ads, different companies, same notebook. Oh, we yeah. overstocked. You know, like, yeah. <clears throat> right. I don't think I believe you because I don't I, think they've really vetted all of their vendors that are on Facebook anyway. I'm Facebook, sorry. No, Facebook has already said that they'll take any ad from anybody without ever. I mean, they said with the political ads, we don't validate, we don't check. And if we it's wrong, and if it's a lie, we'll even we'll, we'll put it up multiple times, right? We 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 well, consider we don't consider it our job. They say. Well, I have five items and, and uh, five hundred people have showed up for that. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, no, the thing I think of with so low fresh is the one is if you drop stuff in the cart, it automatically charges for it, so you don't have to go to registers. They have the special carts. So you just drop the items in the cart. It scans when you put it in your cart, and then you can just leave. Sort of like the scan and go at Sam's and Walmart, but it, you don't even need a device. It's built into the cart. Um, I, I, evidently, the only bad thing is if you have a kid who likes grabbing stuff off shelves. <laughs> <laughs> or you try and take the cart home like the bag lady. <laughs> that, 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 that's tracking it with gps we know where the cart went <laughs> yeah. well i was at a dollar tree and they solved the problem of getting carts out of the store they all they did was took a large metal pipe and taped it to the side of the carts the pipe is two inches higher than the door frames oh really <laughs> yeah so you can't wheel it out of the store to take it to your car which is really stupid because it is because what I would do is I'd get to the door and I'd angle that card up and go yeah. right through. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think they thought of that one. 
Somebody else had one, and I have no clue what technology it was. It was another Dollar Tree. When you went through the doorway, the wheels went into a lock mode. How does that work, Bob? I see you nodding. but Magnets. Magnets. Electromagnetic. <laughs> no, that's just the normal cart. Once it hits something other than the surface of the floor, Dollar Tree, it says, ah, oh, we're in a parking lot. Stop rolling. <laughs> so it's so the the door the doorway has magnet stuff that no, pushes no. stuff. Uh, uh, it's an electromagnetic cart. break. Uh, it just crosses a certain line, receives an electrical signal, and bam, it goes into a breaking mode. And the only way to get it out is if you have a special key, or you lift it up and carry it. <laughs> well, if you've got a cart full of stuff, you're not likely to do. Yeah, that. true, true. <laughs> But they uh, didn't have any sign there or anything. I get to the door and I'm going out and all of a sudden. I mean, every time I go to the store, I have to see, well, is this cart going to be liberal or fascist? Which way does it pull? Or you get that really noisy wheel. Oh, yeah. You get one that, that, that complains all the time. It's just great, 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 great. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, that's a protest cart. There you go. <laughs> Everyone knows where you're at because it keeps on making noise. <laughs> or, or the, or the ultimate—you have all these pay for carts that you have to put your quarter in. Yeah, well, yeah. that's yeah, that, that's the one. That's the one. The best one, I think, is the Aldi way. You know, right. they, you can put in a. a uh, I'm pretty sure you can get away putting in a slug from a uh, electrical <laughs> outlet box. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That might never come out. <laughs> <laughs> it may have a magnet in it, and they just lock in place. Yeah. Uh, I, it might be too rough. It may never slide out. Well, you just take off the burr before you try it. <laughs> well, it's that, not like it's checking work. the edge. Yeah. That takes work. Maybe more than a quarter's work of, worth of your time. <laughs> now, if you work in, a, in any sort of electrician, you probably got a dozen of those things. They actually used to use them in... Uh, Toll booths when they stick tilted coins, but <laughs> it's all electronic in Massachusetts. Yeah, they uh, the what the the other one that they used to use was the good old Neco wafers would work in them too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Problem is, is a Neco wafer into an Aldi cart might break into pieces. <laughs> and then... Well, of course, you only need it long enough to unhook the cart to use it. You don't care after that. Cause... Yeah, true. Yeah. You just <laughs> leave it there for somebody else to grab. Oh, there's no quarter in here. Oh, I got. Well, I mean, you don't even have to then stick it back to try to hook it back in because if it's not a real quarter, what do you, if it's a Neko? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you like eating Nekos and you really want that Neko. <laughs> yeah, I want that Neko back. It was a licorice one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I'm going to have to break off here. I got to okay. take grandkids home. So. Thank you very much for attending. And Thanks, uh, 